For our third intermission feature this afternoon, Robert Tuggle, director of archives at the Metropolitan Opera, will continue his series of recollections of great artists in the operatic world. Today, Mr. Tuggle remembers Claudia Muzio. Robert Tuggle. Thank you, Peter Allen. Fifty years after her death, seventy years after her Metropolitan Opera debut, Claudia Muzio has a life in the imaginations of opera lovers attained by few singers. She died at an age when many artists are just entering their most productive years. Fortunately, her voice was recorded, and recorded well. Here is Claudia Muzio in a haunting song by the little-known Italian composer Stefano Donaudi. There have been many family associations at the Metropolitan Opera since its earliest days. The direct descendant of one of its founding directors sits on our board today. Several generations of choristers, dressers, and stage crew have carried on long family traditions with the company. Many employees have found their mates among their business associates. And out front, members of the audience sit in seats inherited from subscribers and their families while others form new memories to stand beside those of their parents and friends. However, the most romantic event, the most operatic event in Met history, was the return of Carlo Muzio, his wife, and his daughter Claudia to New York in 1916. The New York Times reported from the waterfront, quote, The baggage master of the company, who is wont to meet the most famous opera stars of the world at the steamship piers, and be interested only in the trunks and boxes they bring with them, took the trouble to greet her and show his pleasure over her arrival before he paid any attention to her luggage at all. The baggage master, known as Frank to several generations of opera singers, was like all other old employees at the Metropolitan. To them, the new prima donna was the little girl they had seen lingering about the house while her father, one of the assistant stage directors was rehearsing the company, or when she had come there with her mother, who was a singer in the chorus." End quote. Carlo Muzio was returning to the Met after years with Hammerstein's Manhattan Opera, Covent Garden, and small theaters in Europe. The Met had paid the Geneva Opera House to obtain his release so that both parents might accompany their daughter. In a career only six years old, Claudia Muzio had rushed to the forefront of Italian sopranos with appearances in Milan, London, and Havana. Her starting salary was to be $3,000 a month. In the same theater, her father's peak 
had been $20 a week. As a child, she had watched Antonio Scotti's Scarpia from the wings. Now she debuted with Scotti and Caruso. The first Italian to sing Tosca regularly at the Metropolitan, Muzio was a tremendous success with the public, only partly so with the press. From the beginning, it was clear she resembled no one else. Quote, she had beautiful speaking eyes, mobile, expressive figures, features, and generally knows how to suit her gestures to her words. Better than any Tosca ever seen here, she succeeded with face and hands in expressing her loathing of the villainous Scarpia. Her voice was considered warm and sympathetic in quality, responsive in emotional impulse, ample in volume, and much more powerful in appeal because of its timbre." End quote. Her acting was generally preferred to her singing, and while the extraordinary carrying power of her pianissimi was noted, in a prophetic way a negative review brings us closer to what became the essence of Muzio. Quote, she was always willing to sacrifice vocal display to the need of coloring a phrase to suit the dramatic intention of the moment. End quote. As a child in London, Muzio had reacted angrily to a visitor who had praised her beauty. She didn't want to be beautiful. She wanted to sound like Melba. But the eloquence of her diction, her way of coloring tones for emotional effect, took her on a path diametrically opposed to that of Melba's pure vocalism. Caruso sang with her at her debut, and she became his most frequent partner. In Pagliacci, they were said to be like flint and steel together. For five of her six seasons, Muzio's popularity steadily grew. Enviable assignments were hers. Giorgetta in the world premiere of Puccini's Tabarro, Tatiana in the first American Eugene Onegin, and Maddalena in the first Metropolitan Andrea Chenier. 
Still, for all her success, Muzio maintained second place in the company to Geraldine Farrar, both in salary and choice of role. When she returned to New York for her sixth season in January 1922, she found a new world around her. Caruso was gone. Farrar was about to leave, but Maria Yaritza had taken over the previous November. General Manager Giulio Garicazza explained the situation to Angelo Scandiani of La Scala, quote, As for Muzio, I don't believe I'll rehire her. In any case, I'll be able to cable my decision within two or three weeks. This artist, who in the past was good-natured and obliging, as well as in command of a varied repertoire, has partly lost her head for two reasons. First, her success in Buenos Aires and Mexico went to her head. Second, because the skyrocketing, absolute, indisputable triumph of Yaritza, which triumph several of our artists staunchly and falsely attribute to German propaganda, has put her in an inferior position she cannot bear. Consequently, tantrums, whims, long faces, rebellious attitudes worthy of a prima donna of 40 years ago. All trivia I absolutely can't tolerate. I who have always demanded on principle that the artist be first of all disciplined and obliging, then, if possible, capable." End quote. <laughs> Before leaving New York, Muzio was signed for the Chicago Opera, which became her artistic home. There her rivals were Mary Garden and Rosa Raisa, the first noted for her vivid stage personalities, the other for extraordinary vocal richness. Muzio was enormously popular in Chicago and sang several new roles. Although Desdemona and Otello was among them, her voice remained peculiarly suited to the music of Verdi's successor, as in this little-known selection from La Lesiana by Chilea, in which a mother prays to God that her son will not die.
amor son madre desolada per pietà veglia sulla vita sua per pietà Still, she brooded. A contemporary writer portrayed her confined in a darkened room, bemoaning the supposed intrigues of her rivals, both professional and emotional. She married a young man, and he squandered much of the money she had saved. Her career gradually settled into a pattern of alternating seasons in Chicago, South America, and Rome, where she was reported to be Mussolini's favorite soprano. In 1933-34, there was a brief reconciliation with Gary Kazatza and the Metropolitan. A single performance of Cavalleria and New York and Philadelphia performances of Traviata. Events which in later years anyone remotely interested in singers would claim to have witnessed. For listeners everywhere, Muzio's reading of Germain's letter in the last act of Traviata would become a standard for mingled melodrama and eloquence. Teneste la promessa, la disfida e beluoco, il parone fu ferito, però migliora, al predo in cranio suolo, Il vostro sacrificio io stesso gli ho svelato, e io voi tornerà quel suo perdono, io pur verrò, curatevi, mercate un avvenir migliore, Giorgio Germò. The career was almost over. Suffering from heartbreak and failing health, she died in Rome at the age of 47, possibly by her own hand. Oblivion might have followed, but because of her recordings, especially the series made late in life and underwritten by her, Muzio's posthumous fame has triumphed over all her antagonists and rivals. We hope that voices will sing to us. If we are lucky, every generation or so there is a voice that speaks to us as well. Thank you, Robert Tuggle.